Welcome to the Gluck Solutions Podcast. I am Dr. Errol Gluck, executive life coach, clinical hypnotist, and master problem solver. Today we're here with Hattie Retroage, a self-described cougar who at almost 76 years old embraces her insatiable sexual appetite, having sex with 30-year-old men, and encourages all other older women to embrace their sexuality. For all of you out there who thought sex ended with menopause, think again. With the Guinness record for the world's oldest topless model and the oldest woman to flash Howard Stern, she has become a celebrity coach, featured on Oprah's network and the Learning Channel, and author of several books, her most recent entitled Exquisite Aging. And Hattie, welcome. Oh, and why don't you explain, you know, um, a bit about yourself? What do you do? How did you become who you are? It's fascinating. I think that somewhere there's Brooklyn in your uh, background. Yes. Ah, born and bred in Brooklyn and then moved to Manhattan. As Good. well. Yeah, I did that too. There you go. Now, strangely enough. That explains your strangeness, yes. <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> a lot, darling. <laughs> yeah. Strangely enough, most people never think in terms of aging when they're preschoolers. That sounds like really bizarre. But that's what it took to make a person like me. My mom, who was a Russian immigrant, used to meet a lot of Russian ladies in the steam baths in Coney Island in Brighton Beach. That's in Brooklyn. And there I would be, four years old, clutching at the floor, hoping to get out of there and have some frozen custard. And I'm looking up at these ladies. Now, that's not the best view of women down looking up. And they were meeting me with their breasts and their rears and their thighs. And I'm looking at varicose veins and all sorts of other stuff. And I made a vow at four years of age, if this is what ladies look like, I will never be a lady. And that vow was fine until I had to become a lady myself when I got my period. So I said, oh, great. I hated those ladies, and now I hate myself. And it looked like my future was very bleak, and that's only at early teens. So, Dr. Gluck, you can imagine what that is psychologically, right, for a teenager? Well, absolutely. Now, I would say that most children actually do think about death, and they do have fears about it. But... What was it when you looked up at that women, why did you equate their bodies to somehow to deterioration? Meaning what went off in your head? And why did getting your period, how did that connect to growing older and eventually possibly dying? Was there a fear of death going on with you? No, I don't think it had to do with death, although I totally agree with you. In terms of preschoolers, my granddaughter uh, said to me, just a while ago, she said, Grandma, you're not going to die very soon. I said, well, what do you mean, Kika? She said, you don't have enough wrinkles. <laughs> oh, Hattie, you're never going to die. And when you do, we know how it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm prone to that. <laughs> In any case, so, yes, it also had to do, and I don't know with how candid I could be on, it had to do with smells as well. Okay. And as I grew older, you know, I, I only wear vintage French perfume from actual flowers and things like that. So I did not know that I was a healer, and that came out later in life. So my sensitivity to the body, to smells, to, to looks, to veins, to any of those things, I, you know, a child has totally smooth skin. They see veins, they see hair growing here and there, moles and whatever else, maybe even one breast mm -hmm. if a woman had a mastectomy. I got scared. Right, However... That's... As God would do for individuals, I made it into performing arts high school, and I became a dancer. So let me let me ask you this question: Dancers are normally tortured for not being in perfect shape. Right. Where if you're not thin, and in many parts in many cultures, if you're not thin, you're inferior. How did that affect you? And what you know? What was the what was the emotional impact on you now having to have a perfect body? Well, since I already had a lot of body hatred, then I joined in the camp of dancers hating their bodies. How now, what was your body hatred? Tell me exactly oh, what it was. What specific, didn't you like? 
hated my thighs. Okay. I thought they were, as we called them, thunder thighs. Okay. And definitely hated my breasts. It took a lot of guys to change that opinion. Now, what didn't you like about your breasts? <laughs> they were getting very large, and I would go one way and they would go another. I was a tomboy. I didn't like that. <laughs> No, you didn't go to my elementary school. You would have been very popular, okay? Well, I, I was popular, but not with myself. You I see. see. Okay. That's the problem. However, my passion for music and for expression, and I must have been, that must have been the life force, too, the sex force, was so powerful that I forgot my body when I was dancing. I felt like a bird in flight. Hmm. Beautiful dance. And I remain a beautiful dancer. And I still, I go one way, they go another. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we wish this was, was videotaped so we could see you dancing and, uh, and the different ways things fly. Um, did you ever suffer from anorexia or bulimia? Yes, I did. Not bulimia. I'm a failed bulimic. You're a failed bulimic. Fa- failed you don't like to give anything back. It's probably the <laughs> Jewish part of you. Um, so, but anorexia, yes. And, and how, how far down did your weight go? Well... It wasn't so much the weight because it only went to about 102, which doesn't seem terrible. However, my period stopped for a year. And that was when I was studying with Martha Graham. And everyone was dancers, and I was shorter than they, and I didn't have training as early as they. So I said, I may not be the best dancer, but I could be the most disciplined and the skinniest. And the strange thing, you must have heard about this in your practice. If I took three cornflakes, I would chew them and say, damn it, I should have only taken two. Right. It's, it's typical <coughs> anorexic behavior. Typical. Um, let me go back to something you said because I found it fascinating. You also had a reaction to the smells that yes. you encountered. Now, smell is normally an individual genetically it's a scent to create attraction right. between mates and certain people like certain smells some people like clean smells flowery smells musty smells what probably happened is you began to smell something that was not uh, in your genetic makeup to be attracted to and you actually got repulsed from it um how do smells affect you now very and, and with your with your lovers great you, question. Do you do you pick lovers based upon smell has it I, I discard, if you want to use such a strong word, lovers based on smell. Okay. Very much so. Uh, now, um, <laughs> interestingly enough, I actually will smell the socks of uh, the socks and the shoes of a potential lover, and I'm very gentle with men because even though I'm much older than a lot of my lovers, I really feel a lot of compassion for them. I don't feel like they're giving me a mercy fuck at all. I feel a lot of power and empowerment. So I might say to someone, "Gee, you're a fascinating man. I'm very attracted to you. Whatever. I don't but think we're stink. a match." Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. My but, name is Hattie. Can I have a sock? Ex- How does that work, Hattie? Excuse me. I thought we were good for each <laughs> okay. other, but we're actually not. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is one of those things. Now, this doesn't mean I, I dislike smells of a gym. And believe me, I get turned on by a, dre- a dressing room. I once went into the Canadian hockey team dressing room, and that was fine with me. But it's it's just there are odors. And because I'm a healer and I have that in my heritage, at some point we might talk about that. But years ago, decades ago, and centuries ago, doctors and healers would be able to diagnose a disease from a smell. That's absolutely correct. So I guess I was picking up not only on something that might be unpleasant, but not healthy and not mm-hmm. really clean. Okay, so just like some dogs could smell cancer or disease, you have that empathic nose that was able to actually possibly smell some physical pathology that you didn't even know what it was. That's quite interesting, actually. Well, it's really gorgeous speaking to you because... There's a lot of lightness in my life, as you can imagine. And I did have a lover as a fireman, and he was fabulous. Interestingly enough, he was far younger than I and really buffed and terrific to be with and a sense of humor, and we laughed. And I asked him once, aren't you ashamed of being with an older woman? He said, are you kidding? I go to the firehouse, and they were all jealous. However, he was in 9-11. And when he came to me after 9-11... He was not the same person anymore. 
Hmm. He had all sorts of illnesses that he spoke to me about, growths on his lungs. So that's when there's an interface between the joy and the excitement of sexuality and sex and the reality of not being healthy. And that's part of the reason older people may not be as sexually active as I, because all sorts of things are are going wrong in their bodies. That makes a tremendous amount of sex. Now, I know, as I said, you have this insatiable appetite for (laughs) sex, but do you prefer younger men or do you just like sex with any age? Prefer younger men. Now, why? Well, this is like... (laughs) seems like a question that doesn't need an answer. No, it does need an answer. (laughs) Okay, so I will even talk about it beyond the issue of sex. I am, at at all points in my life, always looking for new projects. I was a dancer and then a dance teacher and a costume designer and a movement therapist and a psychotherapist and um, a writer and a poet, and now I'm a holistic life coach. So I'm always coming up with new things, new ideas, new excitement. That's me. When I was with older men, God bless them, they were quite successful. I mean, I'm an attractive woman, and though I might be an old bar of candy, they would want my arm candy (laughs) with them, and we would travel together. But they were not excited about creating new things in their future. And it's that excitement that turns me on. New ideas, new projects, new possibilities. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I can't fully agree because usually a career, people don't grow up. They grow older. But some people who have that creative spirit are eternally young. Um, we get older, but our minds really stay. You know, we close our eyes. We're all kids. And if a, if a, if a successful man has is an entire life created – Why would he stop wanting to create and explore? So here's the real question. Is it really that creative part or is it what you're looking at that turns you off? It's a great question. It's also that. It's what I'm looking at. Um, I know that as when I work with uh, bodies as a movement therapist, um, I was able to work with uh, naked people. Over the years, there was nothing sexual about the work at all. It was more like Wilhelm Reich, Freud's Mm -hmm. disciple. And over the years, I would see all sorts of things on people's bodies that, for me, did not bespeak true beauty, energy, health, vitality, excitement, sexuality. That's me. Just like with smells, I have preferences. So I'm not attracted to all young men at all. No way. What's the youngest man you've ever been attracted to? Attracted to or, or... Or slept with better. You got it. We didn't sleep, but actually, he was um, 18. 18 years old. And how old were you at the time? 75. Okay. Now, what happened... You didn't even pause for a minute. Wait, wait, no. <laughs> not pausing. But here's the question. What would happen if you found out yes. he was your great, great, great nephew? What? We're not going to have idiot children well, from the blood mixing. Oh, okay. So it, it doesn't matter because we're not having kids. Right. Okay. But that's one of the jokes when people say to me, like, really seriously, what is it you see in younger men? I mean, ah. Uh, so I say, oh, I don't know. I We're thinking of raising a family because <laughs> it's such an absurd question. There's a lot of difference. Um Older men, and I, I, I love the idea of older men going out with young women. They should go with whoever is attractive okay, to so them. Okay, so it goes both ways with App, you. Yeah, goes both ways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're looking a, for a, double entendres here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my next question. Any attraction to women? No. And it was fascinating when you asked me about the smells of these women mm-hmm. when I was a child. It's very possible that the smell of females in particular, is not something that turns me on. That makes a lot so, of sense. Uh, no, I, okay. I have not. However, when I was on the Joy Behar show, she asked us, what turns us on? And I said, well, I'm not a lesbian and I'm not attracted to women. However, if I'm watching you know, a sex channel and I see two women going after each other's nipples, I get hot. Well, it was bleeped. <laughs> You're not allowed to say nipples. <laughs> What can you say to describe that? 
Aureola. I really. Ah, there you go. Well, that's so okay. Everyone's looking up in their dictionary. By the way, that cackle, if my daughter happens to be listening, she'll say, Mom, everything was good, but not that cackle. <laughs> that's my laugh. So, so Hattie, <laughs> yeah. when you were growing up, yes, what were the dear. messages that you actually had about being thin from your parents, from grammar school, junior high school, high school? What messages did you actually receive from your environment? My mother was an immigrant from Russia, and she was never glamorous in any way. But she did take out magazines from the library, Vogue, um, I guess Harper's Bazaar in those days. And I would look at the pictures of the models, but I never compared my body to theirs. I never felt bad about my body until... Uh, I I got my period and started to get breasts and hips. So that did bother me quite a lot. Um, My mother never spoke that much about weight. She was not overweight. She was just like regular. But the major focus on weight and shape and all that came about when I realized I was a sexual being, which (laughs) certain guys reminded me of from time to time. (laughs) And then I was... I was scared. And as active as I am now, that's how inactive I was as a young woman. Interesting. Yeah. Now, I always say when you want to understand anything, Mm. you use two models. You use the model of the cave, the anthropological model Mm -hmm. of how humans evolved, and you use the model of the atom. What's the molecular reality, how the brain itself works? Now, in the cave, women, they gain power only through two things. One was their beauty, and the second was their relationship with the king of the cave, or so so who they were associated with, which is why when men meet, you know, women are interested in their ability to support them, and men are interested in a woman's beauty. You mentioned before that the, uh, the fireman, you know, was absolutely thrilled to have you. Yes. Now, at that story. How old was he and how old were you? Well, that would have been 10 years ago. So I was 65. He had responded to an ad for men under 35. Okay. So I guess he must have been 34. And he literally said, I just made it. (laughs) So Hattie, for you, tell me what the relationship is between sex and love. And do you believe, well, first answer that question. Sex and love. Is there a relationship or sex, sex, and love, love? It depends on the individual. With me, I love sex so much that I would equate sexuality and love. However, there is a difference between sex, love, and being in love. And the being in love is what I crave more deeply than anything. I get the love the feeling, the nakedness, the expression, the kissing, the licking, all those beautiful things which I love, and they express love. But that does not translate into being in love. That's where the distinction is for me. Now, everybody doesn't love sex. When I was married, I was married for 25 years. We had sex about twice a day for 23 years, and then we pared it down to once a day. But it was something that seemed like natural, now, most people listening to this podcast okay, yeah. are saying, once a day, I have sex once a month. Now, obviously, there was some attraction. Oh, yeah, um, he was a dancer. He was a dancer. Why did the marriage end? Well, what happened was when the children left the house okay. to go to college, I, well, actually, before that, I wanted my children to go to Ivy League schools. And we as dancers and having a dance school, the School for Creative Movement, we didn't make enough money for that. So I said, since people are always asking me for advice, I'll become a shrink. Okay. So I went to shrink school. And as beautiful as that experience was, and it was, I had a fabulous um, supervisor, Ben Marinucci, marvelous. I know him to this day. And the dean became my patient. And so there I was excelling. Now, when we had the dance school, my former husband was the star. I had no problem with that. He's a great teacher, a great dancer, great granite butt, terrific guy. He cheated on me, and I stayed with him. So when people think that's what broke up my marriage, it wasn't. What broke it up was he was studying to be a shrink, 
and I was studying to be a shrink, and the kids were leaving the house, and I had all this mothering energy in me, and I became really successful. And he actually knocked at the door when I was working with a new patient, and when I came out, he said, you should have come out, I was waiting for you. And he came home and said to my daughter, I'm divorcing your mother. Now, he didn't mean that. But the word divorce was so odious to me that I clamped my legs shut, and that was the end of it. I didn't do that when he had affairs. Nothing. Marriage vows. But to say divorce to me, no fucking way. And so I moved out. Okay. And that, and then I, I stayed with it. You want divorce, now, honey? You were You're mon- going to get it. You were monogamous with your husband, correct? To- monogamous not only in action, in brain. In brain. Oh, yeah. Right. So do you believe in monogamy? I happen to believe in monogamy, absolutely. Okay. But that's because it's so tied in with this in-loveness. And I still have that quality, you know, the, the ecstasy, the, the kind of, I'm looking up now, this is a podcast, but I'm looking up at the sky because literally it has such an ethereal, spiritual quality. Even though I keep go- going at it like hell's bells, still for me that in-loveness is so much a part. The orgasm, I feel as if I'm ascending to the clouds that has never changed. All right. Now, what you're describing is that right. tantric experience, that yes. full body orgasm experience. Yeah. But it's quite different than looking for love because some would say that your behavior smacks or looks more like an addiction than an ex- than a search for sex. But also what, what I'm hearing is that down deep inside that to actually fall in love and be safe and to be in a wonderful relationship where every day you're with the same person is what you really crave. So is that true? Yes, it is. Okay. That touches my heart. Yes, Errol, that touches my heart. Good. Well, um, all of you out there, uh, you have the ability to actually meet Hattie. She would be a wonderful wife and you would never have to worry about having sex once a month. I guarantee it. (laughs) Actually, actually, you'd have to have your heart checked before actually going out with her. Now, Hattie, you said you don't believe in plastic surgery. Now, I- explain that to me, because at the end of the day, it appears that you embrace youth and that you're very sensitive to things like veins and wrinkles and so on and so forth. So, And you're sleeping with men as young as 18. Why not change your body so that it's, it's more comfortable for some younger men? Well, actually, it wouldn't be more comfortable for younger men because, like, what I say to women is, you show me the dick that's saying, I'm not going in there, they're cellulite. They ain't, they ain't on this planet, honey. If the guy is attracted to you, he's not thinking cellulite, varicose veins, it's you who are thinking those things. So certainly, when I'm out there and I'm naked after I was married, uh, divorced, I mean, I was married 25 years, I'm thinking, gee, no guy's going to be attracted to me because I was so critical of myself. But guys have proven to me they're the ones who overlook all these things. But it goes deeper than that. Mm-hmm. As I get older, I cherish the gift of life. I cherish my sensitivity, my capacity to love. I cherish the moisture that I have on my body and my desires and my reaction to music and my capacity to orgasm. And the biggest change in me happened last year. And what happened last year? Well, having been a dancer all through the years, I wore out the cartilage in my hip. And I tried the equivalent of stem cell, which is PRP, blood spinning. It did not give me any new cartilage. And so I had no choice but to have hip replacement, total hip replacement. When I first heard I needed that, I said to the doctor, well, I'd rather be dead. However, that didn't work out. (laughs) Not that I tried suicide, but it was just my rage at having to go under the knife because I'm such a holistic fanatic. So I was on my way to the hospital for special surgery with what's considered to be one of the best doctors on the planet, blah, blah. And I found out that he does regular surgery and metal on metal, puts metal in your blood. And when I heard that this is what he does, and he's a specialist in this, they assured me, he's not doing that with you. But I said to myself, if he's doing that with anybody, I'm not going to that doctor. Cancel my appointment. And as God and fate and the higher power or whatever anybody believes in, 
a woman who I hadn't seen in 50 years, a former dancer with Alwyn Nikolai, came up to me and, at a show, and she said, Hattie, I remember you. You're limping. I said, yeah, Gloria, I'm limping. She said, what is it? I said, I need hip replacement. She said, don't you dare go to any hospital in New York, and I'll tell you where to go. And she led me to a doctor, bless his soul, his hands, his heart, or whatever. He did something called anterior surgery. He didn't cut any muscles. I was dancing. When I asked him, can I make love, he said, yes, missionary position for six weeks, and then after that, you're fine. Honey. Was that with him? <laughs> Actually, my current boyfriend and he look almost exactly alike, and he's a doctor too. But I was saved from real uh, incapacity. That, and that, that is, and I that got so much respect. I have a light scar. I love it. And now I say, if surgery can be used to give me a life, no limp, legs the same length, I can dance, I can run, I can make love. I wouldn't dare have a knife come at me to make my face a little higher or my tits a little higher or anything. Uh-uh, no way. And this curiosity. I'm a very spiritual person, and I want to see what God has in store for me. Excellent. Now, <laughs> I, I, uh, I agree. Let me tell you where I, I disagree. In the same way that everyone has their own DNA, everyone right. has their own fingerprint, iris print, and so on and so forth, um, in the same way that you were turned off by certain smells, one of the reasons why men l look at younger women is that they don't want to make the association of making love with their mother or right. their grandmother. The Oedipal. So, in fact, or, or they don't, they have a fear of death and dying and being with a younger woman keeps them feeling young and vital. Right. So... So I would not say that every penis doesn't care about the outside. I would say that some don't and some do. So would you say that you happen because you have such great sexual energy that simply attract the people who don't have a problem with it as opposed to saying that no man has a problem with it? Yeah, well, that makes sense. But I think that there are um, older men who have a problem getting it up, even with young women. So it isn't so much that the older oh, woman is turning them off. You can assure me of that. Um, erectile di dysfunction is more common among younger men. Yes, it is more nowadays. More common among younger men than it is older men. Because what happens is there's, you know, part of being a young person is their frontal lobe is not fully developed to about 18 to 25. Mm -hmm. So they have all these fears and anxieties. Every every young person is struggling with fear and resigning, re rejection issues. So... So the level of anxiety among younger men is much greater. And if uh, men are older and they've been very successful, uh, they very often have less experience of ED, even though their testosterone levels are lower, than, than younger men. I don't know how many men you've slept with, but it doesn't uh, work that no, way for no, me, honey. I am, I am, I am, <laughs> I'll tell I you about as, anxiety. I'm terminally heterosexual. Ex now... I have to tell you about anxiety. Have you ever seen a comedian, a young comedian on stage? She's got a boner. Anxiety can keep a guy hard, believe me. The fear in the brain doesn't necessarily make the dick soft. Older men are worried about their back, their heart, their prostate. Those are the things. Then they worry about their aging, then they worry about my aging, and they go soft. Well, I'm I would be very kind and okay with an older guy going soft because actually a younger guy did once, and I simply said, oh, great, now I won't gag. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you a question. How many men have you slept with? Well, I, I guess that over the 27 or so years I've been divorced, I must say about 100. I don't think that's a lot. Okay. Uh, it's enough for a good research study. <laughs> yeah, so about 100 men. And, yeah. and do you pick them or do they pick you? Uh, I, it comes both ways. When I first became divorced, because I only had one person before my husband, and then I was faithful to him for 25 years, I was so horny that I would like be walking down the street, and this actually happened. I'd look in a window display of shoes, and there'd be a guy next to me, and I'd say, aren't those shoes gorgeous? And he'd say, you're gorgeous, and I'd say, my place or yours? And I was a walking yes. That was before I knew that much about AIDS and HIV. Okay. Now I'm, I'm much more selective, but I do not go after guys. They go after me. 
Okay. Yeah, and I have redefined cougar, and I want that new definition to be out there in the world. Well, let's, let's hear it. Well, usually they speak about a cougar as an older woman who's on the prowl for younger men. Oh, you know, I don't find that as a, as a very pleasant thought that I'm out there on the prowl. I've changed it to a, a cougar is an older woman who is pursued and desired by young men. Okay. Uh-huh. Right. So that now is officially out there. Okay. All right. So what, in your mind, is a sexual addiction? And what is, it, what is different from having an insatiable appetite and being open to sex at any time and being addicted to sex? That's a wonderful question coming from you and your background and the therapy you do with people. So I guess you've, you've worked with addictions, and I have questioned myself on that as well. For me, when I was a therapist, I worked with uh, addictions, cocaine, sexuality, whatever. For me, if a person's desires are very powerful and it throws off their behavior in other areas, to me, that's an addiction. If it's something you desire... And it is not causing you to be disconnected from yourself, from your responsibility, from your uh, debts and your payments and your driving and all the things one must do in life. Then to me, I would not call that an addiction because it's the lovemaking. It has a confined time. It stays with you and colors your life and gives you a smile on your face. However, you go about your business and you do what you have to do. Now, I can't say that I didn't have some distorted behavior at the beginning when I first was out there because I wanted to get married. So if I slept with a guy, I thought he would do what my husband did. We had sex. Fuck me. Let's get married. And then we continued. It didn't happen. You know, so I'm going to tell you why yeah. it didn't happen. This is this great, is Dr. G's theory. <laughs> yes, please. My darling. theory yeah. is that emotional intimacy freezes when sexual intimacy begins, and why I told my children, even though you know sex is wonderful and it's great, I always told them try to build an emotional intimacy, a communication, an understanding, a intense relationship based upon communication, philosophy, needs. And then when sex begins, you have a foundation. So what happens is when the relationship starts sexual, it often freezes the ability to go further into that emotional relationship because the, the dating becomes around sex. Let's go out to eat, run back home and, you know, do it. As opposed to let's explore life, explore the world, explore our minds, our thoughts, our ideas. And then when we reach a certain level of trust, comfort, and union, then sexual int intimacy makes more sense. Tell me what you think about that. Has that worked for your children? Are they married and in good relationships? Um, my children are not married, but they're in wonderful relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it has worked. It absolutely has worked. They've... Uh, they have always felt that building those relationships first has simply made them more comfortable and have very, very few regrets. Mm -hmm. So it's worked for them. In my case, my children saw me being very much in love with their father. And that they experienced for their entire growing up. And they knew that we were very sexual because the door was closed. Mommy and Daddy are resting. Mommy and Daddy are resting. And they never came in. We locked the door. Uh, both of my children started out with relationships that were sexual from the get-go and emotionally open as well. And I think that I choose people that I feel an, um, an emotional connection to right away, and the sexuality is part of it. So many times I'm asked, how could you sustain sexuality all those years? And I think it's because, for me, emotional connection, opening up, sharing, trust, integrity are part of it and part of the sex from the get-go. So now, if you were coaching a woman who came to you and said, yeah. I have th three daughters and two sons, mm -hmm. Um, they're quite young, they're teenagers. At what age should I give them the permission or the explanation about sex? And when would it be healthy for them to start engaging in it? What would you tell her or him? I would say whatever you have to do and you feel like doing, I want you to be 100% safe. 
and we are going to talk about all safety, emotional safety, but physical safety. So I don't know when you're going to start having sex, but you cannot do anything without condoms. That would be my major thrust, so to speak, at this point. Maybe years ago before HIV, I would have concerned myself much more with fidelity and all that. It still is. My children are fidelity fanatics, and that is not the insurance company. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm that way too. So they both know that cheating and lack of integrity are grotesque. Right, but that's not the question. The question is when would they begin sex? 16. Now, why didn't you ask the question that are they emotionally ready? When young people have sex, they have a intense, often disproportionate connection mm-hmm. to the person, and everything else falls aside. Yes, it often does. when kids have sex, their grades go, their friends go. Why wouldn't you first see whether or not that child has the emotional ability, stability to actually engage in sex? Why wouldn't that be the first question? I would expect that anyone who's coming to me for coaching is not coming for a single session. So I would say, whatever you do, bring back what has happened. And we would work on their emotional growth in a um, corrective emotional experience with the therapist. And nowadays, I can't use that term. When I started out, you could legally use it. Now you need degrees after your name. But yes, I would expect to continually work on their emotional growth and their possible addiction, because I know how um, how sexual addictions or how the attachment to the beauty of sexuality. Now, my children have always been given that, and my patients, my clients, my friends, the beauty, the artistry. And when it is presented in that way, and when it's tied to impeccable integrity, it has a very different quality. And that quality is exquisite. And, you know, I don't want to reveal my daughter. I haven't said her name or anything. I recently visited her, and she's 48 or something. And I simply said, Rami, you still have sex every day? She said, Mom, of course. You know, like, what a stupid question. (laughs) Uh, Your genetic sex gene, I'm sure it's going out there. Let me ask you a question. You're, you're, You're now, tomorrow, you meet this wonderful 20 year old guy, and you end up in bed. Are you self-conscious of your body? And do you believe that he is of your body? It's a beautiful question. And the answer might seem like it's impossible that a woman can do this. But I have such love and I cherish the health and the vitality of both my body and my life and how I behaved and who I am that I do not. I feel grateful and I feel hot. (laughs) <laughs> and the guy picks this up. Now, I noticed that I'm looking at you, you know, great bone structure, you know, uh, you're thin, you're in shape, you look like you're, you work out. Is there a connection to still needing, wanting to be thin? And do you equate that with being sexual and vital? I do. I don't want to discourage anyone who isn't thin, so I don't have a judgment of other people's sizes. In fact, I'm very positive to everybody's body in whatever shape it's in. But I'm a health food fanatic. I have been from the 60s. I wrote the first organic certification form in the 60s. John Lennon was part of my group, so I've had organic food. I don't eat animals who are vegetarians. I don't eat cows. You know, I don't you eat don't meat. eat animals or vegetarians. I never saw a vegetarian animal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's let's get that back. You you interview the animals and find out what their food preferences I, are. I say, are you attracted to me, or are you going to make me feel self conscious because I'm old? <laughs> you lousy cow! <laughs> don't you call me a cow? I'm not a cow. <laughs> You worm. (laughs) So we're still very health conscious. Oh, we'll go beyond that. Obsessed. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So living a long, healthy life, and do you believe that having sex keeps you young? Yes, I do believe that. I believe that because it vitalizes and ongoingly refreshes and vitalizes your energy on all levels. It keeps all your meridians vibrating. It's contacting the inside of the body. One of the things I feel about obesity, which is one of your specialties, is that there's with that much fat on the outside, there isn't that much consciousness of the inside. Now, this might sound very bizarre, 
But to think of the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, the, all that gets vitalized when you're having sex. You know, that thrusting brings it all alive, and you could feel a throbbing afterward. So you get in touch with your center. And when people want to lose weight, when I speak with them, I said, please don't just talk about losing weight. Let's talk about connecting to your core. It's a beautiful concept. And I think that I've had a lot of these concepts. I think they're God-given. And I said to God, I mean, this is one of my jokes. How did all this start? There were two very long lines up in heaven, and one was for money, and the other was for relationship and all that. And then I'm standing alone on a line, and God says to the team, that woman's standing, let's find out what she wants and get rid of her already. So they come up to me. They say, what is it you want, Hattie? And I said, don't let my breast fall. No. Don't let them drop. They said, done, fine. You know, I could. So, Hattie, I, I wanted, since you mentioned <laughs> God a couple of times, yeah. tell me about your religious or spiritual beliefs. You no, know, that's such a dear question for me. I was raised as an atheist. And if I said the word God, I actually got spanked. My father was trained to be a rabbi and they, in Poland, and they beat him in Cheder, that's the school. And my father said, if they beat children, if God lets them beat children, there is no God. And he became an atheist and a communist. And I, every time in the Pledge of Allegiance, I said, under God, I clamp my lips. And when everybody was singing... Um, Jingle bells. I was singing the International. You know this little, this little red, <laughs> this little communist. However, when my parents died, I went down to Trinidad and I lived in the home of a nun and Catholics who were very close to Jesus. And this actually happened. I heard a voice. Now I'm no Joan of Arc, but I can't deny I'm very sane. I have integrity. A voice said to me. I believed in you before you believed in me. And there were no synagogues in Trinidad. And that's where I, I lived. And I worked there. And I spoke at the first Holistic Expo as the keynote speaker. I went to Catholic Church with my friends. And it was a lot of girls. And we had few beds and few bedrooms. And I slept with the nun. Mm -hmm. And something happened to me. I started to hear directions. I call it testing and training. And I get directions. And they're beautiful. And, you know, you could say, I'm crazy, I'm not crazy. It's really irrelevant. The guidance that I get is exquisite. And I said to this team or God or whatever, please, if there's anything that can really keep me young and vital, however radical, Tell it to me. Give it to me. And I promise in return, I will inspire and help other women. And that was kind of like an arrangement, a deal, a contract with the higher power. And that's what's happened. And now at, at I'll be 76 this month, and I model nude. I don't do porno. No, I, no, I heard no, you. Make no, you I don't. Nude. I model nude, mostly topless, and... Is I that thought, a res result of the, the voice giving you direction in terms of where your life should yeah, go? Yeah, okay. yeah. It's turned out, you know, out of a, I, I ended up somehow in an ad for Dolce & Gabbana, uh, sitting next to a young hunk, and the photographer told him to look at me lovingly, and he did, and I was in a bathing suit, and then everybody's calling me a cougar, and then I claimed the title. I was reluctant at first because I was sleeping with guys. I was attracted to them and vice versa. I was looking for a husband. I did not feel the passage of time. I subtracted the 25 years I was married and went with young guys. And after being called a cougar, other women were inspired by this. They were not put down by this. And sure, I got emails from guys who were telling me where they would like to put their bodily fluids in other parts of their bodies. Of course I'd get that. But mostly from Poland, from Peru, from Mexico, I would get letters from women in their 20s and their 25. Hattie, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're giving us hope. As I walk down the street, people who have seen me on television, on the Learning Channel or on Oprah's Now, on that program, 
strange sex cougars and cubs, they hug me. I can't tell you. And by the way, I never wanted to be around seniors. Literally, I have to confess I was repulsed, thinking somehow it was catching. Now I teach a senior stretch class. I volunteer for that. And I love them. And many of them are younger than I. And I wear sequins because they like to see me as a celebrity. If that works, honey, sequins galore. And I teach them. And I get guidance while I'm teaching. It's so beautiful. Now, I don't want to proselytize about God. Everybody has their own style of doing mm. it. But whatever happened for this little atheist communist from Brooklyn, God came to me in his style and provides for me, and I'm very moved by it, and it's beautiful. And God has also said, Hattie, there is enough beauty on this planet to last you for a lifetime. Stay with that beauty. And I thanked him, and I made a vow. I will live with the joy and trust of a child in the face of adult knowledge of anguish, atrocity, and inequity. I know about that stuff. I don't live with it. I live with the considerable beauty. So, Hattie, what I'm going to say to the listeners right now who are yelling at the podcast, and they're yelling at you, what I would say is that I'm sitting in front of a woman who lives her belief, who has had an experience, whether anyone believes it or doesn't believe it is immaterial, but they live their belief. So what I would say to those of you who have an objection to what Hattie is saying, well, you are not only entitled but you are responsible to find your own belief. And I hope you live up to that belief with the same passion that how do you live up to your belief. You brought tears to my eyes. That is, I could see what a fine therapist and counselor and everything that you do for others because it comes through your voice, it comes through your eyes, it comes through your words. I really thank you for this opportunity. And it's one more example of God or higher power or whatever, giving me the chance to speak my heart and my passion and to inspire and put love and care and um, love and care <laughs> and inspiration out to men and to women for whatever choices they make. God bless them so all. Here's what I don't understand. Hannah. All right. One you thing? Are filled, you are filled. <laughs> well, only one thing. I actually know everything else. But once in a I'm while, dressed, honey. You know. all right, so, so here's... You have passion, you have desire, you have, you have the need to question and to experience, and you have a sensational appetite to learn. Why haven't you fallen in love again? I would think that you are most men's dream. What has prevented that? I have fallen in love three times since my divorce. Okay. It hasn't resulted in a relationship. I Why? Would, that's... That That is the question I would ask myself, and I ask God. And God would keep saying, I don't need you yet. I don't need you yet. And then very recently, very, a 38-year-old physician has said to me, now, I will say it's possible he's a pathologic liar, because I've had those. But he said, Hattie, I have been searching for a life mate, and it seems that you are that woman. Now, there will be a real challenge there. I don't want to get into details, but well, no, this guy is six. Details. This guy is six foot four, and I'm <laughs> five foot three, and so there will be a physical challenge. However, how do you realize you just got into details? I do, okay. but I didn't okay. use any vernacular, any actual descriptions. <laughs> And I have been taking special herbs, so I don't have problems. I don't take hormones, by the way. I take special herbs, and they work. However. This is one way of God saying to me, Hattie, I have waited till you are 76. I have sent you a man of 38. He is a physician, meaning he has passion for healing in the way that I do. This man says you're his life mate. This man says he's not attracted to any older woman and never has been, just Hattie. And if this were so, and this is a gift to be given to me for the rest of my life, isn't that a message to put out? Well, you invite me to the wedding, and I'll uh, put the message out. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hattie, how did, how did Howard Stern treat you? He actually treated me deferentially. 
he started to have too much respect for me. And that's like the killer on a radio or TV program. <laughs> Don't bombard me with respect. We'll fall asleep. So, <laughs> so he starts talking to me. The, the 70. Well, first I was on. I was in my 60s with my first book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Looking and Feeling Younger. But I went on again with this book, which is my memoir, not retro age, but Sex and the Single Senior, A Cougar Search for Love. That's a real memoir. It's not salacious, Sex and the Single Senior. I went on. And the first time I was in my 60s and he asked me if everything was real and blah, 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 blah. This time, being in my 70s, he figures this woman, like, if she takes her top off, I'm going to, like, throw up, give me a paper bag. But I knew what was hiding under, or not hiding that much under my dress. So when I sat down, he said, it says here you're going to take your top off. I said, yes, what are we waiting for? (laughs) And I made sure to have something that I didn't have to pull up over my face. I took the top of my dress over my head. It was a halter top. Pulled it down, and there I am, button, butt topless, standing up. And my breasts are standing up. I said, they're standing up to the test of time, Howard. Right away, he knew, what am I going to do with this woman? I mean, this is not a mother figure. This is not a grandmother figure. She's old, but the tits, like, they're really good. He said, well, that looks very good. I said, how kind of you, Howard. <laughs> so... Actually, Howard had made an anti-Semitic comment before we went on the air, and he's Jewish. Yes, Jews are known to do that, actually. Yeah, but this was, this was pretty disgusting. Okay. And I didn't bring it up, though I have written him subsequently for an apology. But I... Well, what was the comment? Well, he and Robin were joking in the way that they do, and they said, you know, Oprah's taking people to Australia... And they were cheering, cheering, cheering. Oprah could take people anywhere. Whereupon Robin said, or her Howard said, everybody, we're going to Auschwitz. Well, listen, I can have jokes about dicks and cocks and pussies and anything. I'm not that sensitive, as we know. But my, my comment to that is somehow I'm overly sensitive to genocide, the Holocaust, and lynching. Don't mess there. Mm. It, and my best friend is the youngest female survivor of Bergen-Belsen. So I have a tremendous contact with what it is for that atrocity to exist on the planet. I did not like that funny comment. I didn't right. like it at all. I held on to that. We had the whole show. And at the end of the show, somehow he couldn't get the better of me or whatever he was trying. That was an exciting show. I'm an exciting guest. He says to me, how does your ass look? So I said, well, I'll show you. And I was wearing the dress, which is short, and I turned around, and I wiggled my rear, and I said to myself, Hattie, or maybe God said that, <laughs> Hattie, pick your fucking dress up. Like, what do you care? I was wearing pantyhose. I took my dress off, moon him, and he says to me, not bad, looks better than mine. I said, how would you feel? Excuse me, I don't consider that an achievement. And that was the end of the show. You got the last punch at it. So, so I, have, I have a really important question. Oh, don't tell me that. To- uh, no, wait. No. If you met someone yeah. and you fell, not yeah. in like, not in lust, not but, in, in not, love. but really in love, yeah. and everything was amazing, yeah. and through a freak of nature, something happened to this person, and they were no longer able to have sex, would you still stay with them? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So sex is not the end no. all and be all. intercourse is not the be all and the end all. Okay, I, I mean, I agree. they couldn't get hard, but there's all sorts of ways of exactly. expressing love, I, exactly. and through time, they grow. Okay, so the dick so might not saying, grow. No, no, and I love what you're saying. What you're saying is that <laughs> is that when one thinks of sex, one doesn't have to think of genitals. Exactly. One has to think of connection, right? Of intimacy, right? No, no. Wait a minute. On that genitals line, one doesn't have to think of erections or hard. Cocks okay. or very wet pussies or fluid coming out. You don't have to think of those things, but sexuality, the capacity to make love naked with another human being, honey, to the day you die. And maybe after. God hasn't told me that no, yet. I was going to ask you, did God tell you anything about sex in heaven? <laughs> he said it's heavenly. <laughs> he said it's heavenly. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, Excellent. 
Well, it has been an amazing pleasure. Right? Uh, so I have a couple more interesting questions. Is that a fact? a fascinating guest. Woof! <laughs> um, have you ever fell in lust with someone older than you? I have not. The oldest person I ever had intercourse with, and I'll use that term, was my former husband, and he was about 51 when we got divorced. So 51 is the oldest man you ever had intercourse with. Yes. All right. So um, all of you 52-year-olds who are listening to this program. Not all. You don't Come have on. a choice. No, that is not ah, true. That's so a- you go 53? Do I hear 54? I- <laughs> Do I hear 55? <laughs> Keep those numbers coming. Okay, so isn't it true, though, that you can't really tell a person's age? They could be 60 but have the energy, the the, the vitality of a 30-year-old. Could be, so absolutely. So why, why are you referencing age? What does age have to do with it? You didn't say, would I not in the future? You said, ah, uh-huh. You found my loophole. Yeah, yeah, loophole. So, <laughs> so what? No, no, I did say, what's the oldest man you would have sex with? Oh, I see. So I answered it that I had. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. I absolutely can imagine that just as I have kept myself in the way that I have been, that there could be an, a man, let's say even older than I, who possessed a passion for humanity. That's one of my biggest turns on at this point. And if there's something about this person and the coordination and the, the um, connection between us had such power relative to life, because my life gets bigger as I get older, and I would expect that, I would be fine with an older man. In fact, I think I want an older man. And to have a life together with a powerful commitment to humanity that we carry through, and this sustains our love. My former husband and I had a major dancing school in New York it wasn't just his body and his and his potency that turned me on. It was that he taught, and I taught. We taught people dance, movement. You see, so this guy has to be someone who has such a passion for humanity, even beyond his passion for me. And together, we will make a glowing difference for humanity. And you can see on my face I, I do. how you that know excites what? And I me. Want, I, I'm sorry that people can't see you because she has the face of a healer, incredibly passionate in her eyes. It's not just the sexual energy. It's the energy to embrace and heal. Now, so what I do in my practice, I do executive life coaching. I, I do rational cognitive coaching connected to clinical hypnosis, but tell me what you do in your practice. I hear it says body work psychotherapy. What do you do? I don't actually do that anymore. Okay. Partially uh, from legal points of view, but also because uh, having uh, evolved uh, intellectually and learning so much more about life from being older, I actually coach people, and they bring any sort of problem. No issue is taboo, and that's the most important thing of all. When I was a body worker, and I did psychology with them, psychotherapy, because I'm a trained psychoanalyst. I studied at the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis. The dean was my client. I know about Freudianism, defense mechanisms, and all those things. I use that plus therapy where I found defenses and blockages in the body and physically work them through by going into what Reich called body armoring. So pathology can be held in the musculature, and I helped work that out with them in movement. I don't do that anymore. Uh, There are personal issues relative to my own health. I think I gave that service for a certain number of years. I descend from healers. My great-grandmother, Baba Chaya, was a healer in Russia. She healed the legs of the Kazakhs' horses, honey. They were legendary anti-Semites. That's, that's, that's far from the atheist upbringing which you received. I know. So I, I want to say this to, yeah. to my listening So audience. I coach people, and I help them and teach them and guidance, and hopefully in the way that you do, I, to I, bring them to their highest and deepest truth and to 
help them have a life of beauty, integrity, and contribution. Excellent. I, we're running out of time, but I want to say this to my listeners. Um, sex is a part of life. And if you are in any relationship, committed or dating, uh, Hattie, I want you to buy her books. I want you to see what she has to say. They're on Amazon. She, she, They're she not in bookstores. She wants to, more than anything, she wants to bring more love and connection in the world. Now, whether you feel that that should take place only in marriage or whether you don't, it's not really what we're discussing here. What we're discussing is the healing power of sex to keep you young, to keep you alive, to keep you vital. And I think she has something important to say. And Hattie, you are a wonderful guest. I want to thank you. And I want everyone to go to her website, www.holisticallyhattie.com. That's H-A-T-T-I-E. Order her books, Sex and the Single Senior, Exquisite Aging, and The Complete Idiot's Guide to Looking and Feeling Younger. My current books are Retro Age, Four Steps to a Younger You, and Sex and the Single Senior, A Cougar Search for Love. And those are on Amazon, and you just so Google go, Hattie, and you'll so, find so, me. So go buy them. <laughs> I'm Dr. Errol Gluck. Remember, to every problem, there is a solution. I am your problem solver. Please. Go to our website at www.glucksolutions.org or call me at 212-599-3195. Till next time.